Hi, it is time for this week's Thinking Thursday. And for all of those who are out there, thank you for joining us once again. I'm your host, Bronwyn Lucas, licensed professional counselor, certified Christian counselor, and life coach. And I look forward to talking with you tonight. Tonight we have a guest. We, it won't be me alone. We have the esteemed Dr. Zina Bell. Um, she is a licensed psychologist with a clinic invested in community vitalization uh, via membership of the Coalition of Urban Resource Experts, better known as CURE. Her practice provides patients with mental health services. She is the 2019 recipient of the Association of Black Social Workers Community Service Award. I've known Dr. Bell for many years, and she has um, always done awesome and great things in the community. So I wanted to have her on tonight because I know she has a lot to offer. Uh, we will be discussing um, a sort of a charged topic, um, but we can ch be charged and be calm. We're going to be talking about racialized trauma. Ooh, that sounds heavy. We're going to find out in a little bit what that is when Dr. Bell comes on. But we want to always start off with breathing and relaxing and centering who we are. And before we manage this topic, we really do need to do that. For those of you whose first time it, it is to join us, we always start with some deep breathing. Deep breathing has so many positive attributes to it. What happens when you're deep breathing? Well, you're putting more oxygen into your brain and you're allowing yourself to think more clearly. You're allowing your brain to function and allowing your brain to say, I need to wusa and relax. So in order to do this, you're going to breathe in through your nose slowly as I do a count of four and you are going to breathe out through your mouth very slowly. So let's breathe in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. One more time, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. So I want you to hopefully feel a little more calm, a little more relaxed, and ready to just wusa and ah, be ready to listen. And of course, I don't want you to just listen. I want you to be involved. So tonight, our topic, as I said, is racialized trauma. But first, I've told you these great things about my friend, Zina Bell. Um, Zina, how are you this evening? I am well. Thank you for that relaxation. I needed it. It's been a long day. Oh, I know. And it's near the end of the week. And by Friday, we all want to just woosa and relax. So hopefully, even though we're talking about a heavy topic will leave people with some positive things to do. Um, can you define that term racialized trauma for me? And does it have anything to do with post-traumatic slave syndrome? Well, I kind of wanted to do it stepwise. I was thinking that we would talk about what's trauma. Okay. Then we would talk about what racialized trauma is. Then we could talk about PTSD and just kind of build on it. Sounds great to me. So tell us about trauma. Um, trauma is something that creates unbearable pain or hurt. That, that when we have experienced trauma, it can be pain, a pain in our heart, a pain in our body, a pain in our soul. Trauma is an unbearable hurt. When we talk about racialized trauma, it's just what it sounds like. It's the unbearable hurt 
and pain that happens because of the color of your skin. That sounds pretty heavy. So just because of the color of your skin, you're going to experience trauma, hurt, hurt in your heart, hurt in your core. Wow. It's it's the idea that someone doesn't want to serve you just because of the color of your skin. Or it's the idea that you are shot and left in the middle of the street just because of the color of your skin. So I presented a range, but those both those instances can hurt. One results in mm-hmm. death, the other one results not being served at a counter and having to go to the back door. Um, it causes a decrease in self-worth, self-esteem, the sense of being a second-class citizen. That's what we talk about when we're talking about racialized trauma in America. Now, it might be different in other places, but in America, it's based on the history of the enslavement of people of African descent. And it is. And so it's something we can't avoid. No, because we can't change. It's it's based on our physical appearance. Um. So we can't avoid it. We're identifiable. We carry it with us. So, so you said, how, no, go ahead. No, go I'm on. Sorry. I'm sorry. You said, how is this related to PTSD? Mm-hmm. Now you're getting, you know, now you're getting into the clinical part. You know, post-traumatic stress disorder is a clinical diagnosis that is based on a medical model. But what, but the essential criteria of PTSD is that the person is exposed to a life-threatening situation or they know someone that has been exposed to a life-threatening situation and then they develop symptoms. So the clinical diagnosis of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is related to racialized trauma when you're talking at clinical diagnosis. And, you know, when you say being exposed, we're exposed every day. And it's an exposure. Being African-American in America, we're exposed just by waking up. And as soon as you go outside of your house, you can um, experience the trauma. Um, It can even be trauma. It can be secondary trauma that you're Mm -hmm. watching. Mm -hmm. Like when we witnessed the George, Mr. George Floyd killing. Um, seeing that over and over again is exposure to that trauma that can further injure us. Right. And, and I can also think about not just, you see it. And then if you're a mother, a parent of a son, and you see that every time you think about your son leaving the house could have um, a really scary feel for you. How does that relate to trauma? Um, so it's that intrusive image that in terms of PTSD or being traumatized, because we can play it over and over in our head. Mm-hmm. We can create an image which causes us to respond physically and emotionally because we have that image in our head. Yes. So we're walking around with a high center arousal. You know, our muscles are all bunched up. We're frowning because at times we're worried about our loved ones. It's not just our son, you know. Right. It's it's our daughters, too. Our sons, our daughters, our friends, our uncles, our fathers, our mothers, it, ourselves. You know, that kind. So it's that constant fear that's always in the can sort of always there in the back of your mind, in the back of your spirit, in your heart. And um, when people talk about epigenetics, they talk about certain things that can be passed down, that trauma can be passed down Mm -hmm. through the genes. So we may not be responding to just a here and now trauma. We may be responding to a trauma that was afflicted on our ancestor. And when we think about living here in America being black and being America, 
the history of slavery and the trauma of slavery has been etched in our DNA. So you, we look at, we look at this, these situations. We look at the effect on our psyche. We look at the effects on our body. We look at the effects on our spirit. And I'm going to go a little historical now. Um, one of my, one of the first um, books that caught my eye was by Naeem Akbar, The Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Akbar talked about the psychological legacy of being enslaved, but he also talked about religious images and how seeing a white savior could affect our sense of ourselves. Um, so one of his solutions is to remove the imagery. And as we look at what's going on in the 21st century, removing statues that are representative of that image, of that history, that um, glorified that period of time. Mm -hmm. The next generation won't have to look at those statues. So you see it as a positive thing that we're removing those negative images that are put forth for us to just revisit this trauma? Yes, because one of the things we see with trauma is that things that remind us of that trauma can trigger intrusive thoughts, memories, a physical response. So removing Robert E. Lee or removing Dick Dowling will take them out of our external environment, but we still have to do the work on our minds and our bodies. I agree, but and it has to start somewhere. So starting with the external can help us move toward the internal. You know, we, we've talked about how much it's there. I want to pose a question while we continue to talk. I want to pose a question to the audience and let some questions come in and we can talk about. If you're out there listening, I want you to think about a time where you felt hurt, the first time you felt hurt because of your race. How old were you? What is your earliest memory that it was something negative to be black? Where someone said something to you, implied something, and you remember it. How old were you? And tell us, share us that experience. Um, I wanted to try to see, Dr. Bell, what can you share about, you know, working with people finding that first experience? Um, I was, you know, I was over here thinking about, I, I have to shift back a little bit mm -hmm. because I was thinking about the work that we have to do in terms of the first experience, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of having been exposed to uh, not being liked because of the color of our skin, that that can cause our bodies to carry a weight, that can cause our minds to carry a weight, that can cause a little girl to say that she doesn't like the color of her skin, or one of the classic studies where the little brown children did not select the little brown doll. Mm -hmm. Or when we have media representation that shows us beauty is not what is represented in the media. You know, it's changing. We're seeing different ways of being beautiful, but we also have... Um, skin bleaching creams. Mm -hmm. So we're working on it. As a society, as a country, as a people, we're working on it. You know, we're working on it, but it's a lot of work to do. I wanted to bring up that experiment uh, for those who may not be aware. Uh, were, and this was in the 50s or 60s when it was first done? This was, yeah. And what happened, children were brought in, little brown children, little girls were brought in, and they were given two dolls to look at. And they were asked, which one is nice? 
which one is pretty. And they did not choose the one that was brown. They chose the little white doll as looking nice, as the little white doll is looking pretty. The bad thing about this, that was then. This study was replicated in this century, and the outcome was very similar. So now we're, we're just beginning to see things. Um, it was a news story I saw this morning. Viola Davis is on the cover of Vanity Fair, but this is the first time in the history of the magazine where it was a black photographer um, and a, with a black subject on the magazine, and this is 2020. And that just stood out to me that, wow, it's a lot. We, do, we still have a long way to go. We still have a long way to go, and change is incremental. Yes. So, the, you, you know, we talk about the revolution. We talk about opportunities for change and taking advantage of the momentum that we're experiencing now. If you are an advocate, if you are a poet, if you are a writer, if whatever you have to offer, take advantage of advocating for that change because we have a lot to do. We do. Well, I want to share something that has popped up on Facebook. Um, Kendetra says that I was in the ninth grade uh, when a classmate, and this was in 1992, Excuse me. When a classmate wrote in his paper, if he could change the world, um, he would bring back the enslavement of black people. Um, and if he could, they were asked, what could I change in the world? And that's what he would change. What do you think it would be like if you were in a class and you maybe were the only little black child there and this was the comment? How do you think that would have impact that person's psyche and how could it do you think it could have long-term effects? I, I really do think it could have long-term effects. I think that what you see people doing is that they try to become invisible, mm -hmm. that they disconnect from the sometimes, not all the times, but a person can disconnect from their sense of blackness, from black culture, and begin to identify with the oppressor. And by doing that, they no longer see the value of themselves and of their culture and of their people. And it, because you want to identify with the oppressor because it's safe, it feels safe. But the other side I've seen in situations like that, it will also make some want to fight. And then you become the aggressive person. You're thought of as being overly aggressive when it's not that you're being overly aggressive, you have been offended and the aggression was really toward you, but if you respond in a physical manner, you're considered the aggressor. Because you shouldn't have gotten insulted. Right. So the rules are different. Yes. And I don't I think the rules are still different, not just in nineteen ninety two, but I think they're still different. I agree. Um, so, mm -hmm. go on. No, no, no we're, we're talking about the effects on children and children grow into adults. Mm -hmm. And it still happens today. I can think of an incident when I worked at a, um, a school of, you know, Houston. It was in West U and it was in around this same time, um, late 80s, early 90s. And there was one black child in the, they had a, pre, a kinder first grade slash classroom. And I was on the kinder side. There was another teacher on the first grade side. Of the kids there, there was only one black child. Um, and about 15, 20 kids. One little girl was having a birthday party. So she brought her birthday party invitations to the school. Everybody got a birthday invitation except for one child. The black child. Well, of course, he was upset because he didn't get it. He's in kindergarten, and, and they had been at this daycare school since they were babies, so he really didn't understand um, what was going on. Well, of course, the parents did. Um, and being a little radical that I could be, I made sure the parents knew <laughs> that this happened. 
So one of the other parents, white parents, took it upon herself to make sure that um, others weren't going to support this party. Because the little girl couldn't invite him, and she said it. She didn't know. Well, my grandmother doesn't want him at the house because he's not like us. Um, she, said, yeah. she said that? She said that. And she was five. I don't think she really understood. She knew what grandmother said. And so she openly said that. And so I'm like, well, how is he not like us? I don't know. My grandmother said he's not like us. Like, what are you asking me? Um, so, yeah, it happens. But those were incidents from early 90s, but they're still going on. If there's someone out there um, who can think of something that may have happened even more recently, I can think of some, but share it on Facebook. Type it in. Uh, we'd love to hear. Are children still facing these issues? Back to you, Dr. Bell, just looking at that, looking uh -huh. at um, racialized trauma. That is an interesting um, topic. That's just an interest, interesting way to look at it. Um, so tell me more about how you see racialized trauma. Okay, so... Um there's a, a trauma therapist. His name is Resma Menakin, M-E-N-A-K-E-M. He has a book called My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathways to Mending Our Hearts and Our Bodies. And part of his theory is that we when we have experienced, he's a body-centered therapist, mm -hmm. and when we have experienced these traumas, those hurts, those pains are lodged in our bodies. And part of what we have to do is to face that hurt, identify where it is in our bodies so that we can work through that discomfort freeing up that discomfort and creating more internal space. Uh, so it's a therapeutic process. Mm -hmm. It's not something that happens overnight from a healing perspective. So when we talk about racialized trauma, he's also built on Dr. Joy DeGry's work. She has, she has a book called Post-Traumatic Slavery Syndrome. And in that book, we, she explores how values and beliefs and traditions are passed down that are based on having been enslaved. Racialized trauma is a function of, is because of the slavery that happened in America. Mm-hmm. And it still continues. The effects are still there today. Um, you know, we see the trauma continuing. Right. So that's part of what we talk about when we're talking about Black Lives Matter. That there is violence being committed against Black bodies because of the color of our skin. We are treated differently from a judicial standpoint because of the color of our skin. We are not hired because our name may be too ethnocentric mm -hmm. or our hairstyle doesn't reflect the white culture. Those are all injuries. Those are woundings to ourselves. And we carry that pain in our bodies. And I think a lot of times we don't even realize how much we carry it in our bodies and how it impacts our bodies physically. You know, when we are holding in all of this, um, the pain that we may not be in touch with or the pain that we may not even want to address because it's too faint, painful, we're holding on to it, and it can impact us physically, physiologically. And I think some of our health issues may be tied to all of the pain that we have experienced and continue to experience. 
Well, you know, the, you know, the other part, Bronwyn, is that we've talked about the strong black woman. We've talked about black women not being able to cry. Um, we've talked about um, having to have a job that as a black as a black woman, it is not attractive to be vulnerable that I remember being in a group with other black women and crying and being laughed at because I was crying because to cry is a weakness. Mm -hmm. So, and so we internalize our emotions, which can be expressed physically, which is, you know, what you're talking about. So you can see higher rates of hypertension. You can see higher rates of heart disease um, because it's twofold. We're having to deal with the situation externally and then internally we're having to manage it and the skills we're using to manage it further hurt us. I agree. We have non-productive skills because one of the skills is we're going to ignore it. Because if I'm strong, I don't feel this pain. As you said, someone would laugh because you're a black woman and you're crying. Really? What yeah, are you crying look, about? It, you know, get over I stand, it. Get over it. Suck it up. What's the matter with you? And if you can still get up and keep moving, you ignore that pain. And this you know, is what you which is why we go to the doctor later. Right. I was just about to say it goes to physical. And my theory, and I've talked about that before, is that when we look at health and wellness, health is just health. Whether it's our physical health or our emotional health, it's still all our health, our mental health. And we do ignore it. We ignore our physical. We go to the doctor Later, because we don't trust doctors, for one, and that historically we have reasons to, we definitely don't seek help for mental health issues because we don't trust it and we don't have time because we don't have mental health issues. But all of that is making us sicker. It is. Um, our, and it's all because of that trauma. And even our relationship to the healthcare system, be it physical or a mental health system, has a lot of trauma attached to it and our mistrust. There's a lot of trauma associated with that. There's, they're right. There's historical trauma. So we're, mm -hmm. you know, so we have reasons to not engage in help-seeking behaviors. Um, the question is, what are the solutions? We, we, we know that this is our reality. What right. are the solutions? And that's just where I wanted to go. Let's start. What are some positive things um, that we can talk about to share? Okay. Am I supposed to go into the guided imagery? I now? think that would be awesome. Let's. Um, we have probably stored up a lot of emotions um, for people, and people may have been thinking of some of those things that have hurt in the past. Let's do a moment. I want you to take this moment to do some guided imagery, to do something to show us that there are ways to feel good in the moment. Okay, so I want you to get comfortable. Close your eyes. You Take a moment to ground yourself in your own body. Notice the outline of your skin and the slight pressure of the air around you. Experience the firmer pressure of the chair, the bed or the couch beneath you, or the ground or the floor beneath your feet. Can you sense hope in your body? Where? How does your ex body experience that hope? Is it a release or an expansion? a tightening born of eagerness or anticipation. What specific hopes accompany these sensations? The chance to heal, to be free of the burden of racialized trauma, to live a bigger and deeper life, Do you experience any fear in your body? 
If so, where? How does it manifest? A tightness? As a painful radiance? As a dead heart spot? What worries accompany the fear? Are you afraid your life will be different in ways you can't predict? Are you afraid of facing the pain of growing? Are you worried about staying stuck in the pain? Do you feel the raw, wordless fear and perhaps excitement that comes with change? What pictures appear in your mind as you experience that fear? If your body feels both hopeful and afraid, congratulations. That's what we need to face healing from racialized trauma. Open your eyes, take your time, reorient yourself to your surroundings. Breathing deeply and noticing how you feel in your body, taking your time. When I, when I first did that exercise, um, you know, I was reading my, from my grandmother's hands. And when I first did that exercise, I felt a tightness in my heart for the hope, but also a tightness in my heart with the fear the fear of confronting the magnitude of this problem and how it has so deeply affected me. Um, The instances where I have had to think, should I cross the street now or not? Because maybe someone will want to hit me because they see a black woman crossing the street. The moments in my day-to-day life that have been shaped by my awareness that I am a black woman. This is what we carry. This is what we have to work through. And healing can happen. And I think that it's so important to focus on the fact that healing can happen. It's interesting you said that when you first did this, you felt it in your heart. And that is, for me, how I feel it. And I actually feel a heaviness in my chest when I think about it. And the hope, when I think about the hope, lightens it a little bit. Those of you that are listening, take a moment to write in how you felt about this experiencing this exercise. And I'd love to share it with others who are listening. Um, was it a positive feeling? Was it negative? Did it make you think about things that you hadn't thought about before? Did it make you think about things you did not want to think about? While those are coming in, I want us, uh, Zina, to continue talking about some positive things we can do. Um, how do we begin to release that pain? Um, so part of what we've talked about is, it, it, um, 
um, that we have we have adapted. We're resilient people. So one of the things we've talked about is singing together. That singing together, breaking bread together, are ways to address the healing. Being conscious of the connection. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just that when we're doing it, we need to be aware that the goal of our singing together or the goal of our breaking bread together or cooking together is to bring about moments of healing and connectedness. Um, Other things we talk about have to do with deep breathing exercises and imagery that we consciously develop. We go out and buy books. We do research. We attend workshops. We do more Facebook Live programs where we take responsibility for identifying the pain and things that we have used that have that help us to move through it. So walking helps me to move through the pain. So one of the things that I routinely do is that I will do a breathing exercise and then I'll go for a walk. And during that walk, I will experience an incident. I'll think about an incident and try to walk it out. I'm suggesting that we do those sorts of conscious things to address the trauma that we're carrying in our bodies. And, you know, the conscious things have changed now in the world of COVID. You talked about singing together, breaking bread together, just being together. You know, now we're not able to be in each other's space the way we have been in the um, past. In the past, um, I'm one who loves to entertain. Those of you who know me personally know I love to just, I'm going to cook and say, come over. Or if I'm not feeling like really cooking, I'm going to say, bring some food and come over and just share. And even that is part of the healing because we're creating that positive space. And in I like to do discussions. We might just come and we're going to do whatever. I used to host different things. We are not able to do that now in this world of COVID together the same way. Um, I'm just wondering how we, how do we manage that? Because the Zoom world is a little different in terms of really being able to connect. You know, I, I suggest the outdoor thing. Mm-hmm. I, I suggest that we, you know, it's been so hot, okay? Right. That it's more difficult to do it outdoors, which leads us back to having to use technology or taking responsibility for getting together in small groups and agreeing that we have, we're not ill and wearing our mask and practicing social distancing. And we come up with those people that are safe for us. That this is, you know, COVID-19 is transforming how we live Mm -hmm. and our having to develop ways to stay connected has has been a real challenge. I'm I'm not going to say that that hasn't been a challenging activity because like you say, it's different. Right. We have to find new ways. Um, I have another comment here from uh, Kinetris. He said that the exercise brought to the forefront feelings that I think I have just learned to ignore. I didn't register in my mind until I was asked to focus on the true reality. And I think that speaks true to that we tend to, we've learned to ignore so much. But in in terms of looking at the healing part, what can we do? How can we rebuild? It is. I'll share, Zina, I'll share what happened. I now live in Houston. Dr. Bell lives, I mean, I live in Arlington in the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. What a Freudian slip. I said I lived in Houston. Uh Uh-huh, right. Time for you to come on back. Come on. So she lives in Houston. And as I said, we've been friends for years. So when I was home, um, and yes, I do still call Houston home, we decided to get together. Now, it's 100 plus degrees in the shade. 
So we decided that before I drove back, and this is just a way to connect, we would get together. So I was at my sister's house. So that morning, we got together, sat outside, couldn't really find any shade. And the mosquitoes were out <laughs> early Sunday morning, shade hard to find. So we moved a couple of times to find, uh, find as the shade moved. But we sat outside and we were able to connect and it felt so good to be able to physically be there. Um, so it's a matter of getting creative in the ways you can share with people. Um, and so I challenge you to do this um, because as I look at it, it's after 745. My gosh, the time has flown. Um, but we do need to learn to insulate ourselves from some of the pain as we work toward positive solutions. And now the solutions are different. Our way to connect is different. Our way we interact. And it, it's not just different for now. It will be different. This is an ongoing thing, um, how our world is changing. Um, Dr. Bell, Zaina, what else, as we're running out of time, what things... By way of hope, what things would you like to say? Um, oh, that's a good question. Let me give me a second to think <laughs> about this, Bronwyn. By way of hope, mm -hmm. um, I hope that we can have more conversations that address how racialized trauma interferes with our being successful, how it mm -hmm. interferes with our working together. I don't even want conversations. I want the conversations, but I hope it can also help us to tolerate each other so that we can work together effectively. Even if we don't like each other, that are, there are certain issues that are in the best interest of us as people of African descent to work together. Um, so my hope is that even though we are not all the same, that there are certain issues that will affect us all and we can work towards that through advocacy, through prayer, through mental health wellness, through making money, that any kind of way that we can impact the institutions the structural racism, if it's just the one-on-one -on -one and being able to recognize that I just came from a place of racialized trauma and I and you need to interact with me differently because my hurt caused me to lash out. Mm -hmm. I hope that we can gain the tools and the expansiveness grow and that is awesome so i would like in a couple of weeks for you to come back and we explore that some more oh you set me up no you didn't <laughs> that's what friends do <laughs> so now you can tell all the people listening no you don't want to come back that's all right if that's how you want to handle it but I no, think <laughs> I, I, I'm going to come from a place of positivity. I you know did not, you did not set me up. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't set you up. I wanted to share your expertise more because it was such a short time because you're such an awesome thinker that I just want to share your expertise more. It wasn't a setup. It was just, ah, we need more of this. This is not a conversation that we need to necessarily end right now. You're, you're absolutely correct. I agree. I do. And there, there's so much more that we need to explore. And there are ways to heal that we can just, you know, drop these nuggets and practice it together. And then you can take those nuggets to your people and we can have a domino effect. Yes. So we do need to focus on ways to heal. So I really will. I um, I will tell you because she's my friend. I know her schedule is pretty tight. <laughs> However, I'm going to get back <laughs> on her schedule because she's my friend. Um, so for all of those who are out there in listening land, I do want to um, share this with you. And I've said it before. Don't be afraid to th seek out help, to seek out a therapist. 
it's okay. Remember, mental health is just part of your health. You, well, you need to take care of all of your self-health. And that, as we see it, that's part of our trauma that we don't, but you need to. I am a licensed professional counselor in the Dallas area. Dr. Bell is in the Houston area. Reach out. Seek help. It is okay. Um, If you can call me, I may not be the person for you, but I will help you find help if it's not me. You can reach out to me by giving me a call at 682-272-3949. You can reach out. Um, Dr. Bell, any comments on them seeking out help? Oh, um, you can reach me at 713-522-3015. My website is drzinabell.com. Also, you can, um, the Coalition of Urban Resource Experts is a grassroots organization of African-American mental health providers. We do trainings, um, healing circles, cultural competency, uh, and our website is www.cure4.org. Uh, so feel free to reach out and we can share our expertise and learn from you also. Thanks for sharing that information. Well, I hope you have found a little nugget of something that can be positive and that you won't continue to ignore those feelings that you have. You realize they're real and they are valid. The experiences that you've had make you who you are. We don't have to be held captive by the trauma we've experienced. We can grow from it. We are a resilient people. That's why we're here today. So as I sign off tonight, I'll sign off as I always say, remember, mental health is health. So enjoy, share this information. If you have friends who are not on Facebook, they can go to YouTube or your podcast stations and you can listen again. And I look forward to next week. I won't tell you the topic, but on my Facebook page by Sunday, I'll let you know. Bye and have a great week. Ashe.